Welcome to the Anime Research Group, a show about the weird and wonderful mistake that is anime. I'm Ian. I'm Denny. And this week we have a special guest, Matteo Watsky, writer of the blog Animitudes. Welcome, yeah. Matteo. Hello. You're officially the first guest on the podcast. Hopefully not the last. This is such a honor. I've been trying to get guests on for like a year, and it's like, all right, we've, we've, we finally need to do this. So mm -hmm. like, you were the first person I asked, and the first person I said, that said yes. So Inviting people is hard. Indeed. Yeah, so the, the plan for today's episode is that we're going to uh, ask Matteo a bunch of questions, uh, mostly about his blog and uh, about his work for his master's degree. So he writes smart, and we don't smart. <laughs> <laughs> You're kind of smart too, but not as much as me, obviously, but uh, kind of. Yeah, obviously. We're going to see how this goes. We've, we've never interviewed anybody before. So we should start with oh, the no. easy questions, which I guess the first one is, well, how did you get into anime and, or animation more generally? Was it like as a kid or uh, was this something that like you, you started like as you were older? Uh, uh, unlike most people, I think I didn't start, a, start anime as a kid. Uh, I, I started by manga. Uh, my first manga was, uh, I believe... Uh, Detective Conan. Good choice. And I really liked it, and I got into the anime after that. Then it was a pro a progressive process. Like uh, after that, my next big big love was Bleach, both the manga and the anime. This was around 2013. Hmm. Then the big uh, the big moment was when I watched Cold Geass and uh, absolutely fell in love with it. Yeah, to um, a certain extent, I always feel that like people who watched Code Geass after it aired were not getting the full experience because part of like part it's, it was like when One Punch Man was a big thing is that I think half of the experience of watching Code Geass was shouting Jibun Wo on 4chan every <laughs> week. Yeah, I, I totally get that, and and also um, Code Geass is uh, I really loved it back then, and and obviously uh, I cried like a little girl at the end and everything, but now that I. I've watched more anime and more mecha and everything. I I'm afraid of rewatching it because I know that it's actually not that good. I totally understand it. It's like I definitely refuse to rewatch any of Dragon Ball because it will never be as good now as when I watched it as a child when it was the best thing I'd ever seen. Yeah, same. I guess this is a this is a big difference from me and you then in that I still regularly rewatch one old Pokemon and two Excel Saga. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one day uh, I'll rewatch it, but just for the animation then, and like uh, with the sound off so that I I don't notice how bad the plot is. So, so it's one thing to be like the kind of person who watches anime even regularly, and it's another thing to write pretty detailed articles about it. What was the event that sort of triggered this change from just watching anime to writing about anime? Well, uh, the Cod Geass thing was around uh, 2014, I'd say. So. Because there's a lot of time uh, being an anime fan. Yeah, your blog only start your blog only started uh, this year, I believe. Yeah. So the thing is, I've been having the idea for like uh, two years, I'd say. Um, but what really triggered it was um, the fact that I applied for uh, a master's thesis and in different places, and one of them was a master's thesis on anime. But I wasn't sure I would be I would be accepted because basically the thing is. I applied for a, for a degree uh, in cinema, I mean, film studies, but I haven't done any film studies before that. So I thought, yeah, m maybe the, un the university won't take me because I don't have uh, enough qualifications. So I said to myself, well, maybe I won't get taken. So if I want to write about anime anyways, I'll just make a blog. And I went for the blog, uh, which was supposed to be not that much of a, a big thing at the start, but uh, I did get taken in the university, but with lockdown and, every and everything, I found myself with tons of time. So I wrote and I wrote and I wrote. It's quite impressive. And I haven't read all of it, but just the six articles on TMS I've written, like, I don't know, that must be like a good 20, 30,000 words, probably more than that. And then most of the articles are just as long. It's impressive just how much you've written in one year. I think my biggest uh, advantage is, the, is that I write really fast. This is a, a big help. Yeah, I, I th I, I'm kind of the opposite. In like, Danny will confirm this, is that I'm a pretty good note taker. I can write lots of notes, but then the actual converting it into finished works takes significantly longer. <laughs> I know you chose the name Anime Etudes because it's just anime studies in French for your um, blog. Yeah. 
we specifically wanted to ask about the headline, the tagline, taking anime seriously, and why you think anime generally isn't taken that seriously or discussed all that much by fans uh, in a more serious context. Because that was also one of the reasons we started our podcast, because we felt that the majority of the podcast of like discussion about anime is just, that was cool. I enjoyed that. That looked nice, but less like in depth research on it. Mm, yeah. Um, but first, about the, the actual title, Anime Tude. Uh, the 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 little trivia, uh, if you want, is that initially I wanted to do the blog in French because mm. there aren't that many uh, good French blogs about anime and especially about Sakuga. So I felt that there really needed to be one. But in the end, I went for English because uh, I knew there would be more of an audience in English. Mm. Uh, but I kept the, the French name because I had no other idea for an English title. Mm. Their names are hard. Did you never think about just having like French versions of your work and have like a separate just French version of the blog? Because I don't I don't think it should be too hard to simply translate it. Yeah, I did think about this at the start, making like yeah two versions, uh, an English one and a French one. Uh, kind of working with a the group of French Sakuga fans who want to create their own, their own blog, but uh, everybody is really lazy. So and the blog. <laughs> Blog project has been in the works for like uh, six months and nobody has done anything. So maybe I'll just do my own uh, French version. But uh, yeah, for the headline, I, I guess it's like you said, uh, the idea of bringing a new, how can I say this? Uh, yeah, serious. Academic? Uh, kind of, yeah, academic kind of writing. That was, that was the idea initially. Uh, do some academic-like work, but on a blog, because I thought that maybe I couldn't do real academic work on anime. Yeah, so before we start talking about some of your articles, um, I guess the one thing I would really want to ask is, you've been watching Lucky Star recently. How? <laughs> what have you been thinking about it? I loved it. it. It's not good enough to go up into my favorites, but uh, it's really very, very good. And my biggest regret is not to have watched it as it aired, because w watching it in context must have been absolutely fabulous. I have just such like good memories of watching that during like the peak of the Haruhi era. Oh, that must have been wonderful. I, I didn't I didn't watch it like as it was airing, unfortunately. But like what one thing that I don't like publicize is like my old mal account. <laughs> uh, and De Denny has seen this, but um I keep it kind of as a shrine to my teenage opinions. Uh, <laughs> and one of the opinions that I used to be kind of embarrassed of is that I gave Lucky Star a 10 out of 10. I don't think it's a ten out of ten show anymore, but I do still, I still, it's still like a really important show to me, and I, I think it was like tremendously like underrated. I think partly because of just this the silly cornet thing at the start. And I put off Lucky Star for a long time because I knew that I wouldn't be able to understand it without all the references and everything. And what really surprised me is how much it re it references old anime. For example, the original Gundam, and there's mm -hmm. a ton of Gundam references, and I only expected like two thousand references. I think I can be called a retro anime fan, and so this was a, a good surprise for me. This is like my decision to not watch Neon Genesis until I've seen all of Gundam, which I am now yeah. partially regretting. Yeah, but y you mustn't just have seen everything, of, every Gundam. You must also have seen all Ultraman, which is, <laughs> I think, harder. Yeah, that might be a bit more work. I mean, I've made it, I'm currently on just starting Gundam Age. I've made my way through quite a lot already. I think you've seen more than me. <laughs> what 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 uh what would you say is the best Gundam that you've seen so far? Um I will make a lot of uh, of enemies if I say this. <laughs> Probably Double Zeta. That's okay, that's a very that's a very interesting opinion. Yeah, I I'd say Double Zeta and Unicorn. Double Zeta definitely isn't the best Gundam objectively, mm. but um I have a lot of affection for it. I really like how it does it, its own thing. Mm -hmm. It just tries to be different and it, it succeeds. Like I actually agree, and I quite like. I, I think I prefer Double Zeta over Zeta, just because I like Judo as a kind of more fun hero. I like yeah. the villains a lot more, like Marshmire Cello, and I like uh, Haman Karin. It's mm. just so much more fun to watch than the, the at times very dour Zeta. But to my yeah. to my mind, still the best Gundam I've seen so far is War in the Pocket. Oh, I I, I have a really uh, um, hot 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 take on War in the Pocket. Is that uh, is that is my least favorite Gundam? So Ooh. okay, okay, we should have this discussion at some other point because I, uh, I don't want to. Get into this. 
at some point I'm going to have, have this podcast make an episode on War in the Pocket and we'll invite you again and then we can have this argument. <laughs> <laughs> but for now we should move on to some of your uh, other articles that you've written before we go into the main thrust of this uh, interview yeah i guess a good place to start is at the beginning i think one of your first a- a- articles was on uh the q film liz and the bluebird um yeah. and i just wondered if there was like a sp- special significance to why you chose that out of all the possible anime in the world right because it's my favorite anime movie obviously that's a really good reason is the first time I, I wrote about. Initially, there was a French version of that article, which was much smaller and less good, maybe. But then when I launched the blog in English, I translated and expanded upon it and just published it. I've noticed that like you often refer to the works of Naoko Yamada throughout your work. Would, would you say that she would be one of your favorites, uh, possibly even the favorite like uh, director in anime? Oh, yeah, uh, totally. She's... Uh, along with Takahata and Ano, she's uh, in that uh, big uh, top three of uh, really great directors. I mean, I think I think one of the things you said is, uh, and I, I I can't I don't have the quote to hand, but it was like something that like she was like the I think you said something to the light effect that she was the best one since Takahata, and like really I I don't know what I know what I want to say like getting realism or <laughs> how should, I don't know how to phrase this. Maybe not the best since Takahata, as a, as if. Uh, there hasn't been anything good uh, since then, but of course, she's one of the, I think, the very few directors that that's on the same level. Because for me, Takahata is really uh, on on a level of his own. It's mm-hmm. every one of his movies is is such a, a complete revolution of the entire animated medium. Yeah, Takahata is is really a, a god figure. Something I was wondering about is when you write about something, how do you decide to write on it? Do you start with a with a topic and then you look for an anime that kind of fits the topic you want to discuss? Or do you start with an anime and then you look for a topic inside said anime? It's more the second, uh, but it, it depends. When it's uh, simply analysis uh, of works like uh, what I did on uh, Liz, I, I watched the movie and I, I thought, oh yeah, maybe this would work well as an analysis. And I tried it out and I wrote it and... And it went up, but for the uh, for the history or more theoretical uh, articles, it's pretty different. But uh, when I do an, anal- an analysis, I start with the with the anime, and and then I try to to have ideas uh, on it. But it's very much uh, improvisation, I think. Okay. Right, because uh, one of the things that I wasn't entirely sure about when I first read your started reading your blog was whether or not you were actually more interested in theory in the sort of like the critical study sense of the term or if you were interested in anime history. Because, for instance, you do write on things like militarism and Gundam, identity and BNA. But then, like, you've got this six-part work on TMS that just sort of kind of, like, dominated your blog for a couple of months. Yeah, uh, that's because my interests uh, shifted. <laughs> um, <laughs> at, at, at the start, I was really, really into theory. I was in my big uh, uh, Thomas Lamar per- period. So I just wanted to put out tons of theory. So that's when I, my post on uh, on Liz was bas- was an analysis of the movie, but also basically, uh, yeah, m- maybe you could say a, a, a sort of manifesto because I, I tried to explain what would be my approach to animation and why I think animation is actually important. Because my, my thesis for the article was that um, why uh, doesn't Yamada do live action? It's because what she does could only be done in animation. And so at, at the start, this was really my, um, what I wanted to do, ex- ex- explore really animation theory, um, Sakuga mm-hmm. theory in a way, and uh, the specificities of the animated medium. It was interesting that you made that like specific comment about Yamada and live action, because I think that for anyone who thinks very hard about Satoshi Kon, who is like my go-to guy, <laughs> it's always the same question is like, why is he making all these films about cinema, but animating them rather than doing live action and it's very interesting that they both sort of they, they come out from different places but arrive they they have this sort of same destination yeah, yeah. something to that effect <laughs> <laughs> totally agree i'm i'm less of a con fan i have to admit one of the one of my unpopular opinions is that i've never been uh, as much in love with con as most anime fans seem to be but yeah this is the exact same uh, problem. I mean, the main reason Ian is such a fan of Satoshi Kon is because he looks like Satoshi Kon, so he <laughs> really identifies yeah. with him. I understand that. 
That is purely a that is purely a quirk of biology. I have no I have no control over that. <laughs> I mean, my obs- is my obsession with Dark Souls explained as with the fact that I'm curiously like a Western version of Hidetaka Miyazaki. I don't Possibly. know. Probably not. Sadly, I I don't think I look uh, enough like uh, Yoshinori Kanada to <laughs> for that to explain my obsession with him. I mean, I mean, I've ne- I have never seen a picture of you, but I've seen like all the pictures of like cool Canada with his sunglasses and stuff. <laughs> so, may- so maybe you just need to get a pair of sunglasses and wear them indoors. <laughs> Before we move on, um, there was just something I was personally curious about again, namely that y- you primarily write about older shows. Listen to Bluebird is probably the most recent thing you've written about. So, do you still watch like seasonal anime and newer stuff, or do you primarily just spend your time watching all like the old classics and trying to study the different animators in them? Yeah, no, uh, I haven't watched season all in a while. Maybe I'll I watch um, Dad Love when it regularly comes out and not just a random episode uh, whenever Oshi uh, wants to. The problem is that uh, I really have, uh, despite my best wishes, I really have this historian mindset. So I have to dig into the origins and historical evolutions of things. And I've always watched things in chronological order and follow things as they come out. This is weird. But this is kind of how my brain works, so I just follow it. Yeah, that, that is indeed very interesting because I generally, for the majority of shows, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily feel the need to go back and rewatch every single bit of anime mm-hmm. history, that I, so that I feel that oh, Yuru Camp is coming out. I need to understand all these other cute girls doing cute things shows to understand like Yuru Camp on a better degree necessarily. Yeah, mm. I, I like to watch more seasonal, but basically. Old retro anime is a, is a hole, and once you fall into it, uh, it's hard to get out, <laughs> like everything, I guess. I think this historical approach is uh, interesting, because I think it ties into your uh, how you view the Sakuga and the Sak- and Sakuga fandom as a whole. I mean, you've definitely described yourself as a Sakuga fan, so like, I guess the first thing I would say is, like, what does Sakuga mean to you, and like, what do you think it means to be a, a Sakuga fan? Big question. Rather than answer it directly, uh, the relationship with uh, anime history is kind of what interests me because initially I thought that um, one of the main contributions of Sakuga was to uh, bring in this um, this awareness of anime history. Like most Sak- most Sakuga fans will know at least something about uh, Toei Doga and uh, Yasuo Otsuka and Kanada and this kind of thing because it's the essential things you have to know to... Uh, well qualified to speak about Sakuga, but I realized that a big part of the Sakuga fandom is uh, big quotation marks stuck on uh, seasonal anime and what's airing right now and just in this kind of uh, presentism. Mm. So if I have something to bring to to Sakuga discourse and anime discourse, it, it, it would be maybe the bringing the history back on Sakuga because it's it's really interesting and really important. I think I think that we all kind of understand why there's uh, so much of an of chasing after what's current. It's because, well, if everybody's watching, I don't know, Attack on Titan. Attack on Titan, I guess, is a pretty no, good not example. That, not that. Well, the, the current season, not so much of a good uh, example of that, but it's a way to bring in the people who you wouldn't normally think of as being interested in these animator or production issues but they are Attack on Titan fans. And also, I guess the other reason is normally that it provides always like something new that they can be talking about so that they don't, I guess, run out of things to say. This is perfectly legitimate. I mean, I we're, doing, we're all doing this more, more or less for fun. So it's... Hmm. But I think it's great that there are things that go on the both sides. I, I wouldn't even presume to compare what I've been doing to uh, Benjamin Ettinger's work on any pages. But it's true that the disappearance of, uh, well, the fact that he doesn't write for it anymore and that it was the most important uh, Sakuga blog and blog about anime history while Etinjo was active, it, it, it was really a great place. And the fact that it, he doesn't write for it anymore and that it, it's kind of disappeared, uh, it's, it's a real shame because you don't have any counterpart to these very interesting blogs Sakuga fans that only speak about uh, current events, so to speak. I mean, I guess there is also just a little bit of an entry problem for the average seasonal fan to getting into Sakuga. Like, your work probably would be very helpful for somebody who's new into Sakuga, but when they 
when they see a cool scene in an episode, so that looks really cool. I wonder who made that. And then trying to find that isn't necessarily the easiest, just when you have no idea what you're really looking for. Thus, yeah. they kind of maybe take a look at it and get kind of repulsed by how difficult it would be and stay stuck in the just, oh, I'll, I'll, it looked cool. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll just enjoy I'll just enjoy it purely on the visual aesthetical side and not really think too deeply on the production side of it or why this was made that specific way if it was referencing anything. So I think if I were trying to summarize like your fantastic set of articles on Sakaga, one of the things that you said was uh, that Sakaga is the awareness of what goes on behind the scenes and that this entails that Sakaga isn't a thing but a process, not something you watch but that you do. Like... Can you explain a little bit more what you mean by that? <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, I guess there's a lot to unpack, but basically, uh, as for the, the beginning, the the fact that it is the awareness of what goes on behind the scenes, just as uh, as you were saying, it's not just limiting yourself to enjoying the visual aspect, saying, oh, that looks cool, but wondering about how that was done, uh, by whom, um, in what way, why, and for um, it's going further than just... Uh, simple and immediate uh, aesthet aesthetical uh, appreciation. And so that entails very different things. In my case, it's uh, anime history, but for, for example, uh, Kevin and uh, the Sakuga blog, what they're doing is more like a journalistic approach about uh, how the industry uh, goes on, right, is working right now. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of, uh, of different practices, but, but that's it. The, the thing I, I really wanted to say was that being a Sakuga fan is not just uh, enjoying uh, the visuals, which is what people mean when they say, oh, this scene was Sakuga. What I meant was that Sakuga is all the different things people do when they go further than uh, just enjoying the visuals, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I think I, I understand. It's all about actually just it's looking behind the screen essentially it's looking behind behind the corners of what you can see on your television or your laptop at yeah. the person who made this <clears throat> how was this put together why does this work the way it does is he referencing another animator and trying to gain a greater appreciation like i always think of like the gynex pose when i learned that the original gynex pose came from a um a guy. From a Geta Robo uh, manga, yeah. I was like, holy shit, I never knew that. That's so interesting. And that mm -hmm. then gives me a bigger appreciation for every time that pose gets reused because I now know where it comes from. And that kind of speaks to the historical approach you were talking about, where knowing where something really originates from then gives you a greater appreciation for all the future uses of said thing. Mm. I, mean, I think it's interesting because certainly when I first started hearing the phrase Sakiga, whenever I first heard it, I definitely uh, associate it more with to be indelicate animator worship, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, um, totally. which I, I felt was, I don't want to say snobbish, because I feel that that's like underrating the people who do that. They're they're shining a light on people whose work is not necessarily being quite as appreciated, but from a certain kind of person who I thought was maybe gatekeeping a little bit and saying like, well, this is a better way to enjoy anime. I'm the biggest uh, Canada saint on Twitter, so I, uh, I totally <laughs> fall under that too. But, but yeah, this is a, a common image you get of Sakuga fans and also one that I kind of wanted to, to dispel, even though mm. the, ob obviously this series is made for Sakuga fans, so not people who really uh, identify themselves as uh, these uh, snobbish uh, yeah, people who just uh, make, uh, make animators their god and things like that. So I want to make a sort of like a um, sort of historical point here, which is that when we think of like the origins of Sakuga fandom in the Japanese culture, we think of this term like charisma animator and like a certain fandom that does come with, I guess, what I would be of just who I just people I just described as like snobs. But do you think there there was like a distinction back then between the people who were just paying so much close attention to the animation? and people who were paying attention to production, or do you think they were just inevitably the same people? No, I, I think they were the same, and, 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 that, and that this category is, that, is, is what we call otaku. One of the main points I, I wanted to make, especially in the, in the first article, is kind of a, a discovery I made, is that the first Sakuga fans were otaku, and in, in the 80s, otaku were partly sak, Sakuga fans. It's just the, the idea that once you 
you start getting really passionate into a thing like otakus uh, are and were, you start uh, being interested in all the aspects of production. So that can mean uh, uh, making doujin uh, and uh, hentai about your, your favorite uh, characters, but that also means being aware of um, the animators and the staff behind it, and not just the animators, all the writers and the directors and everything. Mm -hmm. Because I think that that was my first introduction to Otaku in the in this sense was thinking back to the manga Genshiken, <laughs> which like kind of defined my notion of like what Otaku was for a while. And the thing that kind of like drew me in was like their discussions about the show within the show Kujibun, and like they were all their discussions were about the not just the directors but like how the production went in the techniques that were stuff and i was like i was fascinated and i was like why do why do people online not talk about this and you would like join like an anime club and then you'd be like okay these people really love anime and they know a lot about it but like no one's talking about these certain things i yeah. mean me and ian were in an anime society for years and years and i can't remember a single like proper discussion on anime that we had that wasn't just about what like what we were watching on screen or making fun of it but i don't think we ever really talked about production stuff or uh we definitely spent more time playing board games than talking about <laughs> yes. animators <laughs> I, I guess the like final historical question i have it comes down to why you think there might have been such a delay between sakuga fandom in japan versus sakuga fandom in the west with Japan, we associate it with like the Yamato era and the introduction of VHS, allowing people to rewatch shows. But in the West, yeah. we kind of have to wait until the arrival of the internet to see a similar thing. I think basically the first answer I would have is that the Japanese have this very special quality that uh, most um, people outside of, Jap of Japan don't have. It's that they do speak Japanese and they can read anime credits. But... More, more seriously, um, I think that the the kind of uh, engagement that Sakuga level awareness asks for developed much later in in the English speaking fandom. To make generalities, also maybe the fact that there were Saku uh, what we would call Sakuga fans uh, at some point uh, outside of Japan, except that they were never self conscious before the internet. There never was this sense of community and stuff yeah so it was more just due to like dispersion the fact that it wasn't as concentrated yeah i mean i assume yeah. it was people getting across vhs rips of various anime just yeah. sitting at home and or maybe with yeah. friends and just talking about it which must and have been nice in its own right also the fact that well, it, it depends on how you how you consider sakuga if by sakuga you mean uh, appreciating the the craft of the animation I think theoretically anyone could have been could have done it. So uh, mm -hmm. there there could have been Sakuga fans uh, outside of Japan. But if by Sakuga fans you mean uh, people who actively look for uh, staff names and try to identify the animators, this would have been much harder because there wasn't that much anime available. Uh, maybe the credits weren't completely translated and things like that. I, I think that uh, I evoked uh, Benjamin Ettinger and what really made him such an important figure for uh, the very early Sakuga community is that he read the Japanese and was able to have access to Japanese release and read mm -hmm. uh, Japanese blogs and credits and stuff like that. All right. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I guess um, just to, before we move on to talking about Canada, the one thing that I did notice is that as part of your Sakuga series, you uh, compiled a series of interviews with like various members of the community. And I was just interested that in who you had picked. Like it seemed like you'd pick people who concentrate on like creators of animator reels or mads and so forth. And I wondered if that was intentional or if it was just who was available. Like how did you select who you were interviewing for that? Yeah, the the mads thing was a total coincidence hmm. uh, because basically I took uh, some other people uh, I kind of knew, like uh, Toadette uh, was. Basically, they co-wrote uh, my TMS series, so I, I knew them uh, pretty well, so it was easy to interview them. Manulos, which was the, the first one I interviewed, were kind of in the same uh, French Sakuga circles, so it wasn't too hard. And then for, for the others, so uh, Geth and Blow, I basically tried to get um, what I believed to be the big uh, Sakuga persons on Twitter. 
I tried to get Kevin uh, from the Sakuga blog, but uh, he was too busy, so he did, it didn't work out. But uh, Geth and Blow were kind enough to, to give some of, the, some of their time to, to the discussion. But I just took what I thought were the most important uh, people and maybe the most representative and went to send them, send them a DM on Twitter and it, it worked out. So, yeah, the, uh, one of the main reasons I think we wanted to talk to you was because uh, I knew from like following your Twitter and being on your Discord server that you were doing a master's thesis and that one of the and you're a massive uh, Canada fanboy and the uh, at least it seemed that the, the Canada was the focus of your master's thesis. Um, and I was just I was kind of, I was kind of interested because you'd already mentioned earlier that you are doing a cinema master's but had not studied cinema. Uh, like so, I guess before we talk about Canada, like what was it that you had studied? Uh, if I were to answer completely, it would be very complicated because uh, I was in a kind of a weird thing uh, that only exists in France and that is basically impossible to explain to non-French people. Okay, so this is one of the école systems, right? Yeah, but okay. I make it short and say I studied philosophy. <laughs> okay. Which is why I was most interested in theory uh, when I started the blog, because I was still in the philosophy thing. When you applied for this master's to write about anime, did you already have uh, Canada in mind, or was that something that came later? I maybe you mis misunderstood me because the the thesis isn't actually about Canada. Uh, uh, it's going to be about Imaichi, but uh, I so I uh, will talk about Canada at least one bit. <laughs> but um, but but yeah, I, I, to take Imaichi, I had him in mind, and uh, I hoped I could talk a bit about uh, Canada via Imaichi. Because I, I didn't think it was possible to do a, a thesis just on Canada, which would have been cool. But it's it's interesting that you say that you say that because um, like it's not surprising like to hear someone being like doing some stuff on like Imaichi, I guess, because he's like he's hot shit at the moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, he has been for a while, of course, but um, the fact that you're saying you didn't think it was possible when it definitely seemed like Canada's shadow kind of looms large over the industry a little bit. I mean, I just read a bachelor's thesis on him like earlier today. Yeah, uh, I know that one. It's it's a great read, but <laughs> but um, what may uh, what made me think I, it wasn't possible is that basically when you don't speak Japanese, there's very little to go on uh, ah. with Canada. So mm -hmm. basically, for, for the um, kind of uh, bibliographic uh, kind of work that uh, academic uh, writing uh, asks from you, it would have been very hard, which, which is why I, I'm writing about Canada on the blog, because I don't have these kinds of, uh, of limitations on the blog. So I can, I can just not cite any sources on the <laughs> blog and nobody will mind. But uh, on a thesis, I have to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe you should tell the, uh, the listeners, because probably they might not be very familiar with Canada, a little bit about him and why he's so important to the industry. Yeah, uh, just in, uh, in, a f in a few seconds. Uh, so Canada is a really important animator that started working in, in anime in the 70s and basically a genius who, whose influence uh, very quickly spread uh, starting from the late 70s to today. And he invented uh, or, or made popular many of the techniques uh, and quirks, uh, visual quirks that are still associated with uh, anime today. Things like uh, very striking uh, animation, what we call Canada Dragons. This is uh, these moments where when flames or lightning uh, take up the shape of, uh, of dragons or impact frames, uh, this kind of stuff. He mostly made them popular. So mm -hmm. uh, an really important person. One thing I was actually wondering while I was reading the... Um... The, that batch of thesis I just mentioned and your TMS history was that a lot of the other uh, like dedicated genius animator at some point moved on to directing and yeah. like uh, creating anime as the whole, having everything under their control. But Canada never did. He always seemed to just remain an animator uh, first and foremost. And I was wondering whether you had any idea or knowledge on why that was. Yeah, um, that's a lot of, there's a lot of speculation on my part uh, on that because indeed it's, it's kind of weird that he never went beyond uh, storyboards, basically. Mm. But first, there's the uh, the birth factor. Uh, basically, in 1984, uh, Canada almost directed his own OVA, so birth, because 
He did the character designs, the plot, the storyboards, uh, the most uh, part of the animations. The, the only thing he didn't do was direct it, but uh, it was a big failure. So even if Canada had the ambition to direct anything after that, I think that it was made impossible by the commercial failure that like, sponsors mm. wouldn't want to work with him after that. It's interesting that you like specifically bring up birth because birth seems to be the end, not just of like Canada's maybe like upward rise, so to speak, but like of his use of these various techniques that you've talked about. And he seemed to have got more subsumed into like just the the regular into Ghibli essentially. Like when I was watching yeah. his Ghibli sequence, they still look great, but they didn't necessarily stand out in the same way some of his older stuff did. I wouldn't completely agree on that for, for two reasons. Uh, first, I, I think the, the the collaboration with Miyazaki was a really great one in that maybe Canada stood out less, but it enabled him to try out uh, new things and show uh, show the extent of his genius, basically. Mm -hmm. That he was able to do something totally different and nail it down just as well. And the other is that he didn't only uh, work with Ghibli. Uh, for example, he also worked a lot with uh, Rintaro, in that in that period in the 80s and in the in his movies uh in his madhouse movies he kept being uh, just as wild and original even though his style went went through uh, a lot of evolutions so his style in the 90s is totally different from what you see in both but he kept being uh just as uh, charismatic and individualistic that's not on Miyazaki movies because Miyazaki uh, is a di is a dictator <laughs> <laughs> So, um, but sticking with um, Canada style, so to speak, um, one of the things that w one of the names that we come up w that comes up when you like look into this sort of history is also the name of I believe it's uh, Yamashita, uh, yeah. is that correct? Uh, who seems to have had many similar a similar approach to animation at the style uh, animation style at the time. Like, is there a specific reason that you think that we always refer to people who've like carried on his legacy as Canada style? rather than perhaps Yamashita style, as maybe Yoshinari might say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually, uh, Yo Yoshinari says he's a Yamashita style animator, which, which is pretty interesting. Um, Yamashita is, uh, is, some, is someone really important, and I think many uh, animation fans and Canada fans like him a lot, but I think is I, I don't like him as much, I think, as most uh, Canada fans would, because I think his style is a... Uh, it's kind of a watered down version of what Canada did. It's the Canada style, but for, for the general public, if you want. Hmm. Canada really, I think he really was a genius because he never stopped uh, innovating and trying new things and experimenting new things in all directions, which is uh, also why he's so important. Uh, whereas hmm. Yamashita just was a Canada's direct student and he saw what Canada was doing at the time. So like, so in the the very short time period uh, between basically 1977 and 1984. And Yamashita saw that and he said, okay, I'll do that and I'll do just that. And he, he did it really well, but y Yamashita was Canada without the genius. It's still great, but it's not that great. Yeah, the, the, he, he, he didn't advance it in any meaningful way like Imaishi did, way, who took it to a whole new level. Yeah, uh, actually... Um, you'll discover uh, when you read my Canada series that what that Imaishi did the exact same thing, but with uh, Canada's late style. Uh, in, the, yeah. in the late 90s, so around, starting around uh, 94, 95, I'd say, Canada started animating like Imaishi would uh, 10 years oh, later. Okay. And yeah, Imaishi uh, took this and pushed it even further. Uh, nobody thought it was possible, but Imaishi <laughs> did it. Which is what leads me to think that uh, the most interesting thing about Himaishi is uh, his direct direction. The fact that he mm -hmm. manages to integrate both Canada style animation and uh, Dezaki style uh, direction. It's like those triple takes and uh, Pascal memories and, and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we can move on to Himaishi in a second, but uh, one of like the th things you have put on your Twitter is this uh, fantastic diagram of animator influences. And it was just kind of interesting that I think people would consider like Imaishi like one of the big carriers of his, his style, but you would be putting him in like the third generation for yeah. uh, the Neo-Canada school rather than anything. Yeah, but well, uh, one, one thing I, 
I've been really discovering uh, over the course of my research, and uh, I want I'd like it to be one of the main uh, maybe themes of the of the Canada School series is that the impression we have of Canada, the way we interpret his work, has been really influenced by his two most important students. So these are Yamashita and Imaishi, both very different from him, but because they're uh, very well known, especially Imaishi. When we think, basically, when we think of Canada style now, we think Imaishi, but that mm. isn't that isn't Canada. That's Imaishi. That's that's close, but that's different. And I like to try to like uncover the the real Canada uh, behind uh, Imaishi and Yamashita. If that makes sense. No, so I'll certainly look forward to reading that. But we should probably talk about Imaishi a little bit more. I mean, since he is the centerpiece of your thesis, what is like your actual research question that you hope to like discuss in your thesis on Imaishi? Or is it more of just a general analysis of his career? Uh, no, ba basically the theme of my thesis is on the shoujo characters, so like young girls. Mm -hmm. um, and it will be, uh, well, two of my favorite directors, but like they're radically different. It's so it's Imaishi and it's uh, Naoko Yamada. Basically, the the idea that I want to explore is how you can create this kind of of bodily experience of what being a a, a young girl is like through animation. How does the the specificities of the animated medium uh, make you uh, create uh, this what I think is a uh, an original bodily experience? Yeah. And obviously the the very uh, strange and irregular uh, Canada-style animation used by Imaishi uh, will be a, a, a big topic. That certainly sounds very interesting. Uh, I, I hope it makes sense uh, summed up so shortly. And Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I get it. It's kind of how they evoke the feelings of being a, a young girl through their atmosphere and sense of style. Yeah. Is there something that you think that like resonates with Imaishi or uh, the work of Canada that is the reason that like Studio Trigger seems to be so popular right now? Um, when I, I think about when uh, Scotland loves anime, the two things that were sold out, so to speak, were uh, the Shinkai's Weathering with You and also uh, Premiere. I mean, to be fair, Premiere was fucking amazing. I've seen it three times this year. <laughs> oh yeah, because to me it seems. On the one hand, very different from where anime has like has went, which I don't know. I guess I think of like has went more in like the Kiwani uh, mold. Yeah. But at the same time, this this tr the Studio Trigger stuff in particular seems to be able to draw a crowd uh, like few other things are. Like uh, Birthday Wonderland or all of the other <laughs> things we watched were like quite empty by comparison. Children of the Sea, which was beautiful but also kind of nonsensical. This is a really interesting question because it's true that Imaishi doesn't have anything when you think about it to attract non-Japanese audiences. Like it, it's very otaku, uh, but like not the uh, 2000 uh, Kyoani fan uh, kind of otaku you see in Lucky Star. It's like a uh, hardcore otaku who watches just 70s stuff. It's pretty weird that it works in that sense. I just I just think because it's it's got this kind of of big nonsensical energy. That's yeah. That's pretty much universal, even beyond the, the big otaku references. I think you can actually bring that back to kind of the 70s and 80s, kind of the super robot uh, anime, which were always just kind of the hot-blooded jam project music style of anime. Yeah. And Imaishi manages to evoke that so well and so beautifully that Imaishi's version of, of anime is what you imagined those old 70s anime to be when you watched them as a child. It's like, yeah. this is what I think Dragon Ball always was, even though it clearly wasn't. But this is what it was in my heart. Oh, yeah, th this is a, a great way to put it. But I think, that, but to my mind, this is, this is curious because when I think about people like saying like their stated preferences as opposed to like their actual preferences, we see a lot of people talking about like realism and narrative and so forth. And which is like, we've just carved a big exception for something that is like, well, we just can't apply the same standards to this. Because it's so dumb, but so amazing, but it's so dumb, yeah. but it's so amazing. <laughs> like that also applies to Redline, which is just a fantastic film. That's incredibly stupid at the same time when you analyze them like a plot level, but it's just so amazing on everything else. It, it's, re I mean, it's really hard to analyze the emotional 
uh, level of anime. Yeah, it it it, it operates on a, on a lot of tropes. So you you have to get the tropes to basically get what it means. I think it's very formulaic in that sense. Even even if it can be very deep and very strong, uh, the the emotional impact rests on yeah, on on tropes. I'd say. I think the problem with like more serious and mature and like dramatic anime about all that realism, that's all nice and good, but to to affect you on an emotional level, you need to have some kind of connection or personal understanding of that really going on. Whereas the nonsense anime, it just, it gets you on kind of a primal level of pure excitement and spectacle to really drive yeah. you home. And I think Ian, the reason you're struggling to understand this is because you're dead inside. <laughs> that's just you. <laughs> I mean, I am dead inside. Me too. <laughs> but yes, this really applies to Imaishi. Uh, I think this is basically why it's so popular. It's, it's just the idea of turn your brain off and just enjoy the spectacle, which is mm-hmm. basically what Promare is. And it's the most beautiful spectacle I've seen in, in a long time. I mean, if, if um, Keep Your Hands of Azuken hadn't come out this year, Promare would definitely be my favorite thing I've seen this year. One interesting thing that you said when I was like chatting with you was that there was like a hidden link between like the TMS stuff you did and the sort of Canada and Maishi stuff you are doing. Would you care to, would you care to share that? Yeah. Uh, hidden link. Uh, it, it's more like, uh, something I, I got the idea for, uh, afterwards, uh, as I'm writing, uh, the Canada series is that basically, uh, now, so it, it will be two anime history blog uh, series that I, uh, I I like to for them to to make to make up in fact a, a single uh, series which I'd call uh, the the Sakuga history of anime which would basically be uh, the history of anime but from the viewpoints of the animators. Mm-hmm. So because the Canada series starts uh, in the late seventies, so basically where I left off on the TMS series. So there's a chronologically there's a continuity. So my big project once I'll be done with writing and publishing the Canada series on the blog is to uh, edit the whole thing, so TMS plus Canada, into a single like, P- PDF file, which would be basically like a book, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, which would be a modified and version of uh, the two series put together. So that, that's the, the secret hidden link. Well, we're, we're certainly looking forward to that whenever mm-hmm. it transpires. The, the problem is that uh, the Canada series will stop basically... Aside from Imaishi, I, I, I'll talk about Promare, which is really recent, but basically it'll stop in the early 2000s. So the, the problem is that I, want, I will want to make the third part about the 2000s and the 2010s, which would be, again, a lot of work, but I, I don't know if I'll uh, ever be up to it because that will mean watching recent anime, which I haven't done in <laughs> I mean, a while. they made some good stuff in the last few years. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's it's totally. it's, fun, it's funny that you're mentioning that region because if I think if this podcast has has turned into anything, it's been my excuse to watch all the anime I didn't have time for in the two thousands, <laughs> <laughs> but or like I couldn't afford the DVD resolve at the time, like a cassette. I think I think we've run on for long enough. So just one, one last question, I I think I want to po- ask you, Matteo, which is: Do you have any hot takes you really want to write about but you haven't gotten to yet? Something really spicy. Yeah, maybe why I don't like uh, War in the Pocket. <laughs> oh, no, but, uh, I, I'm saying this both uh, not seriously and seriously because I really want to write about Gundam, but like uh, not from the anime history point of view, but really from the thematic point of view. Mm-hmm. So why I like Gundam, how I think Gundam articulates its themes and, and everything. And I think the that War in the Pocket would be a good entry point because it's so different from what I like so much in Gundam. That is. Uh, you know blowing my mind maybe as a you know as a as a clickbait title i would say why war in the pocket is so bad <laughs> but but in fact i would explore uh Tomino gundam mm. and show why war in the pocket is so different yeah i think this is related to my hot take which is that one day i need to write why nana is bad actually <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i think that we, this would be a good time to recommend, first of all, everything he has written. It's it's all really good, but particularly the like extensive history of TMS written with Toadette. And also, um, if you're not a Sakuga fan or don't consider yourself one yourself, he wrote a very like detailed introduction, like almost like a recommended reading essay, which is which I've I've basically taken the time to go through and read every link from that, and it, <laughs> like 
it, it took a fair okay. amount of time. If, if I can make a confession, I haven't read through all the blogs I recommend there. <laughs> uh, some, some were recommended to me by other people, and I just checked them re really quickly, and I thought, okay, this, this looks good, so I'll put it. <laughs> well, as anyone who's ever done any academic writing knows, oh, yes. this, is, this, is, this is the secret <laughs> to why the references yeah. are so long, is that we don't read everything. We read yeah. a lot of them. We read some summaries and some are standard references. Yeah. Just like, oh, okay, this is this is a quote I can use. I don't need to beat the other 40 pages of this. <laughs> but if I were going to say one and just one, I guess my favorite is still your one on Naroi, uh, the white weasel from Gamba, which was, I think it was either the first or second of your ones that I'd read, but it was just, it was very interesting because it was like a purely movement-based take on why this villain works <laughs> i think it's my first uh like uh essay that really uh kind of broke out uh, that people started reading which is weird because uh gambano Bolken is really uh, an, an obscure show i mean I, I i couldn't find i couldn't find the clip of original no roy when i was looking for it like i just yeah. got clips from the reboot for, for a few years ago but the the gamba fandom is strong and the dezaki fandom is strong I mean, do you have like a favorite essay of, of yours that you've written that you want that you'd want people to check out? Maybe the first one on Liz. I love Liz so much. Or um, the reboot of that one I made, which is about uh, anime realism, which basically says the same thing, but not just with Yamada, but with uh, Khan and Takata as well. Hmm. I, I think it's a, it's an idea of this uh, kind of specificity of animation and why animation does the does what it does, uh, the way it does them. I like the idea, and, and I think it would be maybe a good introduction to like, the, the, kind of, uh, the kind of ideas I, I play with on the, on the blog. All right. Well, thank you very much for uh, being our guest uh, this episode. Yep. Thank yep. you for having me. Yep. This was uh, really nice, really interesting. This was the Anime Research Group, a weekly podcast coming out every Thursday, more or less. If you'd like to tell us what you thought of the episode or suggest something for future episodes, you can follow us on Twitter at research underscore anime or, or drop us an email at researchanime at gmail.com. As for Matteo, you can find him at animemadetudes.wordpress.com or at Matteo Watts on Twitter. Thank you very much. Bye. Goodbye.